Hello and welcome to Funk Prog Sweden 6. Uh, first, I would like to thank all our recurring viewers. Welcome back to Funk Prog Sweden. And then I would also like to welcome any new participants in this meetup. This is the meetup where we explore functional programming. Um, with that said, let's head over to the agenda. The agenda for today then. I'll do a short intro by me, Magnus. And then we head over to the presentation by Rodrigo. How APL made me a better Python developer. And after that presentation, we'll go over to configuration languages. Can also be functional by TIL. First, I would like to thank our video sponsor, Adabeat. Adabeat is an IT consulting company specialized on functional programming. If you want to know more about them, please head over to their webpage, adabeat.com, or to their social media. Schedule for the coming autumn of Funkbrook Sweden. On the 12th of September, we do another live stream. And then 10th of October, we're live from Kivra. So if you are in Stockholm, head, come over to the Kivra office and join the, the complete community there. And if you're not in Stockholm, we will, as always, live stream the meetup anyway. And then we do another meetup in November. And if you want to support the community, head over to Meetup and join our Funkprog Sweden Meetup community. And also please subscribe on the YouTube channel. And finally, last but not least, if you are super interested in functional programming, want to know more, want to discuss this Meetup or other Meetups, please join the Discord server. And uh, all the links can be found on Meetup or on the, in the YouTube channel. If you have any questions during the presentation, please ask them in the server or use the chat in the YouTube. With that said, let's start and I will head over to Rodrigo. Welcome. Sorry for not pronouncing your name correctly. I'm doing my no. English. <laughs> warm welcome no to the meetup, Rodrigo. No worries, Magnus. Thank you very much for your wa warm welcome. It's very warm where I am indeed. And as I typically say, don't worry about my name. It's it's a difficult name for non-Portuguese speakers. So Rodrigo is perfectly fine. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate being here with you today. And today I want to tell you how APL made me a better Python developer. Now, there's a huge disclaimer I need to make, which is it made me a better Python developer because I'm saying it made me better, right? So there's no, sadly, there's no very objective, concrete measure. And this talk will be a little bit like that. I will be talking about my personal experiences, my subjective experiences. So obviously take everything I say with a grain of salt, but also I spent a lot of time thinking about this and reflecting on these ideas. So I'm not just spitting random thoughts, all right? So with that said, let's jump straight into it. I said, like I said, my name is Rodrigo. You can find me on Twitter at MathsPPBlog, where I typically write about Python because Python is the language that I use the most. And that's why it's one of the languages that we will be discussing today. And I'm a professional Python developer at Textualize. And I also teach Python and blog about Python and write books on Python at MathsPP.com. So, with that out of the way, I just want to say that these slides and the reference links will be shared over here at mathspp.com slash talks. And I'll also show this link at the end, so don't worry about that. Um, yep, this is all of the, let's call it boilerplate I needed to go through. And now I want to, to jump straight into it, and I want to start with this quote. So Alan Perlis wrote, that a language that does not affect the way you think about programming is not worth knowing. And Alan Perlis was also not just a random dude on the internet. Alan Perlis was a recipient of the Turing Award, which I later came to understand is like the Nobel Prize for Computer Science. So again, Alan Perlis is not a random dude. And he wrote this. And at first, when I first read this quote, it, it made some sense to me. I can kind of see what he may be going for. And then I learned APL. And when I learned APL, I felt on my skin what this means. And that's why I'm starting with this quote. And that's why I'm making this whole presentation. So what is APL? If I'm saying that APL made me a better Python developer, 
maybe it's a good idea to know what APL actually is, right? And APL is a programming language. And APL stands for a programming language. And whenever I say that, people usually roll their eyes and say that it's a terrible name. And while I agree, I have to disagree. Because APL is not a pun. So even though APL stands for a programming language, it's not a pun because when APL was invented, it was not a programming language. It was still called APL, but it was not a programming language. It was a mathematical notation developed by another person, also not a random dude on the internet. Ken Iverson, another Turing Award recipient, invented APL as, a, as an alternative mathematical notation. All right. So it's just, it was a different way to express ideas in mathematics. And the what, what happened was APL was so precise and so simple, quote unquote, when compared to traditional mathematical notation that you could actually make it a programming language. You could actually implement it. And so that's how APL became an actual programming language. And that's why you can go on the internet, you can Google for it, you can, and you can actually learn it and run it. And so today I'm going to share how some things that I learned about APL influenced my Python code. And the key thing to understand first, or the, 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 the context that I need to give you first is that APL is significantly different from Python, right? Python is a, it's an imperative mostly, or mainly an imperative language, right? The main paradigm is imperative programming. You can also do object-oriented programming. You can also do some functional programming, sure. But the main paradigm in Python is imperative programming. And APL is completely different. The main paradigm in APL is array-oriented programming, which is considerably different. It's conceptually different from imperative programming. And that's why when I learned APL, I had to learn new ways of thinking about programming, new ways of thinking about solving problems. And by means of doing that, the knowledge eventually came into my Python domain because I just, I had learned new things. I learned new concepts and suddenly I have new tools at my disposal, even when I was not writing APL code. And just so you have a taste of what APL looks like, I wanted to share this single line of APL code and it looks intimidating if you don't know APL and if you don't know any language in the family of APL, this can look intimidating, I'll give you that. And your reaction might be, well, this is very unreadable. Or maybe you might even say that this looks like garbage or trash, which is a fairly natural response. But if you think about it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. For example, I'm Portuguese and I know English. These are my two main human languages, right? And so if I look at, say, Chinese or Korean or Japanese, written Chinese or written Japanese, I could say, well, this looks like garbage. It looks like trash because they use characters or symbols that I don't know. But that's also not, it doesn't make sense, right? Because if I don't know the characters, of course I cannot read it. And with APL, it's essentially the same thing, right? These funny characters here, this is just the way APL is written because once you learn, let's call it the alphabet, then this piece of code makes sense. And this thing that may give APL a bad reputation actually unlocks a lot of the things that a lot of the benefits that come from learning a language like this. So to tell you how APL made me a better Python developer actually amounts to telling you what learning APL taught me about Python, right? So what, what did I learn about Python that I didn't know before learning APL? And again, just bear in mind that mileage may vary. This is a personal account of what I experienced and what I learned. And if you know Python and if you go and learn APL, you won't necessarily learn exactly the same things, right? So just bear that in mind. But I would be very interested in learning, you know, what did you learn about a different language when you learn, say, APL? So I will also be stating a lot of obvious things, all right? I don't know your background, maybe you know some of the things that I will be stating, or after I say them out loud, you will think, Rodrigo, that's so obvious. 
And I will agree with you, my talk is full of obvious statements, but stating the obvious can be good, and a good example of that is the pigeonhole principle in mathematics. If you don't know that, if you don't know what the pigeonhole principle is, I'll tell you right now, and it will make so much sense to you, and you will think, Rodrigo, that's so obvious. And the pigeonhole principle says that if I have some pigeons, and if I have some cages, and if I have more pigeons than cages, when I'm putting the pigeons inside the cages, at least one cage will have more than one pigeon. And that's obvious because there's more pigeons than cages. And this principle, this mathematical principle that's so obvious, lets you prove like non-trivial, non-obvious, non-basic things. So stating the obvious can be good. And it's what happened with me. I kept stating obvious things and suddenly I felt like I knew so much more about Python. And it's enough chit chat. Let me show you what that actually means or what Python things I actually learned. And it all started when I wrote a single short line of Python code. So the line of code that changed everything was this one. Now, this piece of code, what does it do? Well, if you have something like a list of ages, let's say that ages is a list with a bunch of numbers, this piece of code counts the amount of people that are 18 years old or older. That's what this piece of code does. So it goes through the ages, it determines for each of the numbers there which ones are greater than 17, and then by summing all of this, we are actually counting how many are greater than 17. And what happened one day was I was writing Python code and I was just so focused on what I was writing that I wasn't really almost kind of not paying attention to what I was writing, if that makes sense to you. And when I looked back at what I had just written, I saw this piece of code and it surprised me. And it surprised me because this here encapsulates the things that I want to talk about today. The things that I didn't know, but that APL taught me about Python. So let's start by talking about something that are everywhere. And I, I redacted the word here because otherwise I would just give away what, I, what we are about to see. So what is everywhere? What's everywhere in Python? So let's take a look at the sum built in. What if I told you that sum is very related to mean? Sum and mean are very related. If I tell you this, can you, can you, do you know what I'm talking about? Can you figure out what the similarities are? What if I told you that not only sum and mean are related, but also all, join, math.prov, any, and max? What if I told you that all these seven functions are related? Well, even if you don't know where I'm going, you can probably tell that sum and math.prov, they look, they look similar, they feel similar. You know, both take a list of numbers, one sums all of them, the other multiplies all of them. These two functions feel similar. And by the same token, mean and max, they feel similar. They kind of compute opposed things in a way. And we can keep going and we can say, well, all and any, they all feel, the, both of them feel similar, right? They feel related. One of them has to do with the and, and the other has to do with the or. And then we have join over there, sad and alone. So what are the relationships between the seven functions? When I only knew Python, or when I didn't know APL, to me, this was not obvious. I had no idea what the relationships were. But then this will become very clear once I show you how sum is implemented in APL. So sum in APL is just plus forward slash. And math.prod is just times forward slash. And the other five functions look like this. Now, you don't need to know APL to notice that on the right, we have two letter functions. We have two letter implementations and the right character is always the same. So there is a clear pattern here. It's right in front of our eyes. So what is the forward slash? So the forward slash shows that the things on the left, they're all the same because the forward slash is a reduction. In Python, sorry, in APL, the forward slash is the what's commonly called reduce in other languages. And so 
by comparing Python functions with APL functions, to me, it became abundantly clear that all these functions on the left, they're specializations of functools.reduce, which is, well, a reduction algorithm. And by understanding this, and now this is a little bit philosophical, but by understanding this, by understanding that there's connections between all of these seemingly different ideas, this makes it easier for me to go out in the world and keep making new connections and keep discovering how other apparently different ideas connect and relate to each other. And that's that's what knowledge is about. It's about taking different things and finding the connections. And APL just made this connection very, very clear. There's no way you can learn APL and not make the connection. So that's one thing that APL taught me about Python. And I just like this so much that I even wrote a, a couple of articles on this because it's just amusing to me how things that look so different are actually so closely related. So the redactive are everywhere was actually reductions are everywhere. So many Python functions are or could be written as reductions. So now I want to tell you about data-driven conditionals, which is another idea that I got from APL and that actually influenced my code in other languages, namely Python. So let's see what a data-driven conditional is. So if we go back to the line of code that changed everything, this is a piece of code and it works. All right, so this is, you can type this in your Python shell or in a Python file and it runs. But it's arguably not very idiomatic Python code, or maybe this wouldn't pass a code review. And that's fine. I'm not here to argue that this is the best piece of Python code ever. So what I'll do is I'll rewrite this as something a bit more classical or something that a beginner could easily write. Again, the, 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 the thing that we're solving is the same. We have, say, a list of ages, and we want to count how many of them are greater than 17. And so we can initialize a counter, we can iterate over the edges, we can check if the edge is greater than 17, and then we can increment. And the key idea here is that the if statement is answering the question, do we need to add something? That's what the if statement is doing, right? And now what I want to do is I want to modify this slightly. I want to add the else branch that you can see here. So if the age is greater than 17, we add one, otherwise we add zero. Now this is useless, but it's correct. Adding zero doesn't change the value. So this is fine, I can do this, I can make this refactor. Now, by doing this refactor, what I can see is that in both branches, so both in the if and in the else, I have a count plus equals. The only thing that's changing is the value that I'm actually adding. And so I could rewrite this as such. I could rewrite this with a conditional expression. And now suddenly what I'm answering, what my if in the conditional expression is answering is, what do we add? I'm no longer asking, should I add something? Now I'm asking, what do I need to add? And this reframing of the question is what data-driven conditionals are all about. Instead of asking, should I do something? Data-driven conditionals determine how to do something. In this case, should we add one or zero? We always add something. There's always the plus equals. Now what's changing is whether we add a one or a zero. And data-driven conditionals are about that. It's about taking the data that we have and using it to compute the parameters for my operation. And, or instead of determining whether I need to make my operation. Now we can take this further, and we can take this further if we talk a little bit about Boolean values and about the integers 0 and 1. And now this might be, the, 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 the section that follows might be mind-blowing or not, depending on your background, but I'll just go with it either way. So in Python, the Boolean type, which is this one, the Boolean is a subclass of the integers. That's what's written here. Is subclass bool int gives true, and that means that boolean values, or sorry, or that the boolean type 
is a subclass of the integer type. And in Python, this sometimes blows people's minds. And I can understand why so, but if you have enough background and enough context, you'll also see that there's nothing too surprising about this. But okay, given that this might be surprising, then it's often blows people's minds that you could do something like true plus true and get a two back or three times false and you get a zero. And often you will see people uh, advise against doing things like this in Python because that's not the Python way of doing things. And it's also perfectly fine. But this makes a lot of sense with APL, uh, with the context of APL. And I'll show you that. So take these two comparisons. 18 is greater than 17 and APL gives you a one back. And five is not greater than 17. And so APL gives you a zero back. And so APL, like other languages, does not have specialized Boolean values. And again, this is not unique to APL, okay? So I'm not claiming that APL was the first or the only language to do this. I'm just saying that APL doesn't have Boolean values. Now, what's interesting is the way we use this to play with other concepts. So if we go back to counting ages, if we have a counter, say that I'm counting how many people are adults. If I have a value of an age here, in APL, this is, this is very standard code. You know, you have your age, you compare it with 17, and because you get either a zero or a one, what you immediately do is you add it to the count because it's the natural way of doing things. It's just, it's how you're supposed to do it in APL. And so if we go back to the Python code that was doing a similar thing, this invites or this motivates the replacement of this conditional expression by the condition only. So now I got rid of the if altogether, I don't have an if statement, I don't have a conditional expression, I just have the condition and I use the condition as the value. And again, I'm not saying that this is the best Python code and I'm not saying that if I write this, I will pass code review. What I'm saying is that this unlocks a new concept that I was not aware of. Using Booleans as integers or using the values of conditions as values for the operations that should come later shows a new way of working through problems. And this is this would be too long for a talk or for this talk, but in APL, there's many problems that feel like they're very difficult to solve because you need if statements. But if you just reframe the problem, if you rejig things around to use data-driven conditionals, suddenly the problem becomes more simple. It's not just a matter of you need to twist things in order to be able to actually use APL. No, it's you reframe the problem, you reshuffle things, and if you put them together in an APL-friendly way, you actually come out with a simpler statement of your problem. And this happened to me countless times. And again, it's something slightly subjective, but also very interesting, I think. So here, we're using the Boolean directly. That's the key idea of this slide. And I'm going to take this even further by talking a little bit about scalar functions and least comprehensions. So what are scalar functions and how do they impact my understanding and my usage of these comprehensions in Python? Again, let's take a look at APL code. If I type 19 greater than 17, I get back a one because this is true and APL uses the integers one and zero for the Boolean values. Now what's noteworthy here is that if instead of a single 19, if I have a series of numbers and if I compare them with 17, I get a series of responses back. And this is the array-oriented programming in APL. You are supposed to handle blocks of data. You're supposed to handle arrays, much like you would handle a single number. You're supposed to work with 
large amounts of data all at once. And the greater than here is a scalar function. And a function being scalar, loosely speaking, it means that it will try its best to operate on scalars. Scalars are the units, the indivisible units of computation. So in this case, they're the numbers themselves. So what the greater than wants to do is take the 19, compare it to 17, and you get the one. And then you take the 15, you take the greater than, you take the 17, and you get a zero because 15 is not greater than 17, and so on and so forth. And again, this is because the greater than is a scalar function. It just applies to all of the numbers. Notice that I didn't have to loop explicitly over the list. It just assumes that it goes through the whole list. Now, what if I have this list of ages and what if I wanted to count the adults, the number of adults here? Well, if I just take a look at the ones and zeros here, what I really want to do is I want to sum these numbers because I have three adults here. It's the 19, the 42, and the 73. And they, they correspond to the ones right here. And so what I want to do is I, I essentially just want to sum this result, right? But if you remember from earlier, how do we sum in APL? Well, it's the plus forward slash. And so this right here, this line of code in front of you, this is standard APL code. This is the APL way of counting things. If you want to count how many adults you have in an array, you just compare the array with the 17 and you sum. That's how you count things. Or if you have an array called ages, you just type this. So let that thing sink in. Now, what I'll do is I'll take this piece of standard APL code and I'll compare it with a line of code that changed everything. Let's compare these two lines of code. Now, as you can see, there's some alignment going on. The plus forward slash and the sum are aligned. And we have the greater than that's aligned and we have the 17 that's aligned. Now, the only thing that's different here is that in Python, I cannot get away with just this left section. Python doesn't have scalar functions. The greater than is not a scalar function. It's a regular Python function and it expects two single objects, one on the left and one on the right. I cannot put a list on the left and expect it to go over the whole list. No, I need this piece of code here. I need this syntax here to compensate for the fact that this is not a scalar function. So this syntax, this thing that looks like a for loop, this is compensating for the lack of scalar functions. Now, again, of course, I'm phrasing this because I'm, I'm phrasing this in this way because I'm comparing to APL, right? If you were studying the design decisions of Python and the way it's designed in this way, probably people didn't say, okay, now we write for age in ages because we're compensating for the lack of scalar functions. It's unlikely that it's unlikely that this is how they would justify this syntax. But when I'm comparing it to APL, this is how I interpret it. And the way I interpret code and the way I interpret things means that I will either have an easier or a harder time writing code. And before learning APL, I knew that list comprehensions were a thing. I knew that they were good, or I was told that they were good. I, I understood more or less the concept, but I struggled with writing them. And as soon as I created this comparison between APL and Python, list comprehensions became much easier for me to write. Very, very much easier. Uh, I probably should have said much, much easier. Sorry, English is difficult, okay? Python is easy, English is difficult. All right, so... I was taking a look at this for here, at this piece of code, and I was putting it in, contract, in contrast with the thing that's on the left, which is the comparison, the age greater than 17. And the age greater than 17 is the actual expression that matters 
in this context because I'm I'm comparing ages and I'm comparing each age with the number 17. And that's what we really, really care about. So much so that in APL, we don't even need to say anything else. Sorry, we don't even need to say anything else. We just compare it. And in Python, when I write code like this with a comprehension, what I get is I get to put the expression first. And I'll show you, I'll show you the difference that this can make. So let me get rid of the sum. Let me actually just have a list comprehension. So this list comprehension, what does it do? It computes a list of Boolean values that determine whether we have adults or not. So it's similar to the 101100 that we have from APL. But in this case, we, we get trues and falses. So we take the list, let's say that ages is a list of numbers. The for age in ages goes through the ages, and then we compare each one with the number 17. And this is a standard list comprehension. Python is not the only language to have it. Many, are, many other languages have it, and they tend to use a similar syntax. Now, what I want to compare this against is a non-list comprehension way of doing the same thing. So if you're writing Python code, and if you do not know list comprehensions, you would probably write something like this. You would write a for loop. You would start by initializing an empty list. You would iterate through the ages, and then you would append to the list. So the list would keep growing. This is the simpler way of doing this in Python. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but I want you to take a look at the two implementations and notice how there's so many similar pieces of code. Actually, there's equal pieces of code in both sides. They're just in different positions. And most importantly, notice that the age greater than 17, it comes first in the list comprehension, and it literally comes last in the for loop. It's the exact same piece of code. It's just in different places. Notice also how this thing right here, the for age in ages, you can copy and paste it into the, the list expression, um, sorry, the list comprehension. It's the exact same piece of code. It's just in a different position. In the list comprehension, expression first, loop second. In the loop, we reverse. And what I'm claiming is that most of the time, again, not always, I'm not saying that it's, this is always the case, but most of the time when you're writing code, for example, when you're handling the ages of some users or something like that, you already have context, okay? The code you write, you don't write just a single line of code and that's it. That's not the code you write. You write, usually you write a file, different functions, maybe different classes. So you have more context to your code. And with the context that you have, you probably already know that there's an ages list somewhere. And if you start by reading is adult equals, and then the bracket, you know, okay, I'm about to create a list and it's called is adult. So you could probably guess that it's going to involve going through the ages in some way. So what you really care about is checking what you're computing. Because you already know you're taking the age from the list ages. So that's given by the context. And that's why I like list comprehensions. It's To me, it's one of the greatest advantages of list comprehension is, it, is that they highlight the data transformation. I, I just realized I've been rambling on about list comprehensions for a while now. In case you don't know me, which is likely, it's likely that you don't know me. For some reason, ever since I realized this connection about APL or between APL and list comprehensions and namely list comprehensions in Python, I've been a little bit obsessed with list comprehensions. So that's why I just I could just keep talking about this for hours. So let's change slides. And let's go back to the line of code that changed everything. Again, the comprehension syntax here and then the sum. So let's recap what this line of code actually encapsulated, what this had, what this showed, what con uh, sorry, what concepts this used. So I started by showing you that the sum prompted me to realize that reductions are everywhere. And I understood that by 
connecting the Python implementations with the APL implementations and realized that there was a clear pattern in APL. And the pattern just indicated that there were relationships in the functions themselves. And so obviously in Python as well. Then we talked just a little bit about Booleans, the integers zero and one, and data-driven conditionals. And there's a lot to be said about this. And my example of a data-driven conditional was very small. In APL, data-driven conditionals are a standard way of doing things. And so I would invite you to give a go, you know, try to learn some APL because you will see that this way of computing things makes a lot of sense in that context. In Python, it's not that common, but this further prompted me to understanding and finding patterns in code where you actually, you could rewrite just a little bit of code to bring out more symmetry. For example, when I had the if age greater than 17, and then I added the else branch, that was a terrible piece of code to add because it did absolutely nothing, but it then prompted me to realize I could rewrite my code. And APL favored these explorations, you know, just figuring out where I could add more symmetry to my code, which, which would then um, take me to simplify my code in, in some way. I know this is very, very flimsy, very not concrete, um, but it just, it's just, it's how I feel. I'm sorry, I cannot express this in a better way right now. But like I said, I only spoke a little bit about this. There's a lot to be said about this. And then I talked a little bit about scalar functions and least comprehensions. And again, this was a very short, um, a very short explanation of how suddenly least comprehensions clicked for me because before APL they didn't click for me, and now that I learned APL, they started to click. And I've been, like I said, I teach some, I teach Python online, and I write about Python. And when I talk to other people. Many people can enumerate the advantages of this comprehension because there's there's quite a few, at least in Python. But most of most of the people I talk to fail or miss the mark when it comes to like the main advantage of these comprehensions. And to me, it's the readability that comes from having the important expression in the beginning. Because many people say that least comprehensions are readable, and I agree with that statement. The issue is people usually typically cannot justify or cannot point out where the readability or this so-called readability comes from. And I claim it's from the fact that the important expression is in the beginning. And to me, this makes a lot of difference because suddenly writing list comprehensions becomes really simple. And finally, what was even more amusing to me was, sorry about that. So I have this line of code, right? And we talked about small different things and when they all come together again making connections when they all come together i realized that i had in front of me an idiom a python idiom if you just take so instead of having the condition here the explicit expression let me hide it behind a predicate function and if instead of the explicit ages if i just have a random iterable then suddenly what i have is an idiom that counts elements that satisfy sorry that came out weird, that satisfy a predicate function. And I spent some time thinking about this. I haven't done, I don't think I have done enough research already, but even though people will frown, if you write this piece of Python code, people are likely to frown. This piece of code has properties that are not easy to replicate with the other tools or the other ways that most people would probably say that they are, that are better. So. Even though this might look like a weird idiom, this is an idiom that just mimics the APL way of doing things. And you don't usually see it in Python. And I just love it because it, it makes so much sense. You know, it's, it's the perfect way to, to wrap everything I've been talking about. It's this idiom. And I started with an Alan Perlis quote. And I feel like closing off with an Alan Perlis quote that says, and I redacted a couple of pieces. Alan Perlis also said, accumulate idioms. The only difference between Shakespeare and you was the size of his idiom list, not the vocabulary. And so Python has a fixed set of built-ins. So it's not like you and me 
it's it's kept. The number of buildings we can know is kept because the number of buildings is fixed. What matters is in how many ways you can combine the buildings. And so this is what the idioms, this is the idioms that Ellen Perlis is talking about. It's the way in which you know that these functions can be combined to create things with meaning. For example, in the previous slide, we saw the sum of the predicate, whatever, it just counts things. So to me, this is a good way of closing. I just wanted to say, because people always ask, the presentation was built with Snappify and I have no affiliation with, Sna with Snappify whatsoever. I just like using this tool and people always ask me about it. So I just say it up front. Like I said, actually I didn't say, but this is my email. Feel free to reach out to me if you have questions, if you would like me to provide some more reading materials, or if you'd like to give me some feedback on this talk, feel free to reach out. And the talk slides and the written version of this talk and the references, you can find them over at this link. So this was what I had to share with you. And I think I have some time for questions. Thank you very much, Rodrigo. Ve Thank you. <laughs> very nice presentation. And I, I like it. I, I, I'm just going to shoot straight. Uh, there's, yeah, people are liking it in the chat here. Um, I'll shoot my own question. I guess you're like into math, mathematical. Yes. Yes. You, I think that's what you, <laughs> at least that's what I ticked on when you compared Apple and you had the list and scalars and everything. It really, f oh yeah, you must be. And of course, mathspp.com also kind of give away. <laughs> Yeah, we have to give away some things here. Um, right now, I don't have any quests. I don't see any questions. But how hard was it for you to learn APL as a language? I, that's that's a difficult question, right? How hard was it? Well, uh, it's not like I have a, a thermometer. There were so what was surprisingly easy. And which is it's funny because it's what people think is the hard part. So what was surprisingly easy was learning. Let me show you the symbols. The symbols look hard. This is the easy part. The easy part is the symbols and learning how to type them because there's not that many. There's I'm going to say only 70. No, I don't know. OK, so I don't know how people react to 70. But for example, Python has more than 70 built-ins. And I'm not talking about then the, the the sorry the standard library or the three hundred thousand modules you can install from the internet, right? So the easy part is the symbols, these funny looking glyphs. Yes. What's difficult is the paradigm, right? Oh. So imperative programming for me is easy because I already know it well. I just use loops, I use if statements, whatever. Functional programming also comes fairly naturally to me in the in the pure sense because I'm a mathematician. So, you know, no side effects is something that makes sense. That makes sense. Array-oriented programming is the hardest part for me. You know, learning how to think in terms of arrays, in terms of the whole data, and how to transform it all at once to reach my final result. Mm -hmm. That's what was more difficult to me. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, don't I don't have any more questions. I think it was a very nice presentation. It also connected together. Like you can always learn something. You learn a new language and you take it and yeah. you combine it with the old one and you see new paradigms and think kind of elevate your thought and way of thinking really. So yeah, again, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Rodrigo. And as you said, everything that Rodrigo all the links, everything, we'll share it below the, the video on YouTube later. So everything will be shared. We shared all the blogs, everything, all the links and everything. So we'll, if you missed it, want to watch it again, whatever, we'll show it and you'll get the links and everyone will get them. So again, thank you very much, Rodrigo. Thank you. Yes. And with that, we're going to head over to our next presenter, Till, that will join us. Welcome, Till. To Funk Prog Hello. Hello, and welcome to us from Argentina. Thank you for and inviting your balcony. me. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's slightly uh, overexposed, but you can <laughs> see a bit of a city in the background. Yes. So, welcome. Uh, yes. 
Uh, today, I will talk about configuration languages. Um, uh, I hope you can see my screen, and I hope if I press this, you can see more text. Yes, that seems to work. Um, I found this great uh, quote from Dan Liu, which says, uh, configuration bugs, not code bugs, are the most common cause I've seen of really bad outages. When I looked at publicly available postmortems, searching for a global outage postmortem, returned about 50% outages caused by configuration changes. And I personally think, uh, I don't know if the methodology works, but I think the uh, conclusions here are very plausible, that large configuration files and their changes are very much what cause big issues, what cause downtime in servers, what cause uh, a lot of bugs in, in uh, other software, um, because configuration files can be all encompassing, right? Um, so in my personal experience, uh, I worked with a uh, C++ code base, for example. And the one part that I really never wanted to touch was the build system, because it was just huge amounts of configuration files uh, that I don't understand. I don't want to touch that at all. Um, I also work with AWS and AWS CloudFormation. And AWS CloudFormation is just huge amounts of configuration files. Like if you have a very basic simple setup, you're going to run into like 10,000 lines of code. Um, it's getting a little bit windy. Let me know if you can hear the wind. Um, of course, configuration files also can have bugs, but somehow we don't have debuggers for configuration files, or at least I have never seen them. And at the end of the day, configuration is just hard, right? Like programming is hard. Uh, you have, but you have basically only to the naming stuff, right? It's already the hardest part of programming, and you just focus on the word. So configuration can be pretty hard, and it grows pretty hard. And I just want, uh, I mean, most people, when they work on a production code base, um, they will use two faults to try to improve the stability and safety of the code they write, right? You might have a litter that tells you you're doing something weird. You might have a type system and type annotations to check what you're doing. So uh, you're doing same stuff. You might have unit tests uh, that run in CI to check that every little part works correctly. And you probably have code review uh, for people to read the code once it's done. Like I think most deployed system have like at least three of these four things. Uh, for configuration files, though, they're usually very long. Nobody really likes reviewing them. So you just kind of check them, and if it works, it's probably fine. Uh, code review for configuration files usually doesn't do much. You don't have unit tests or anything like it. Um, most of the time, you don't have any type annotations. It just crashes at runtime if, if, if the configuration file is bad. So fundamentally, I think we are at this kind of mismatch that there's so much focus put on proving the correctness of code, and so little on the correctness of configuration files, even though configuration file issues are what actually cost us money by getting our servers to crash, our programs to not work, etc. cetera. Um, so I want to just look at what configuration looks like. Um, very simply, you could, for example, just use JSON. Uh, a lot of projects do this. Of course, we can't have comments unless you use something like JSON 5 or JSON with comments. We don't have comments in here. We don't have many features. We just list them basically in a record. Uh, it's very simple, very easily readable, but we have very few features. And once configuration gets big, it's very annoying that you don't have comments uh, and other such features. But it works. It works. Then the next step is to use YAML. I can now put a comment up here, and I can put the same stuff in. And I have less quotes and less braces. It, it knows that this is a string, right? So I don't need to put quotes. Um, now, I think YAML is really horrible, uh, <laughs> to be honest, because this is still all right, right? But let's look at some more YAML features. Uh, first of all, depending on which YAML interpretation you, uh, uh, implementation you use, you can do stuff like this. Now, I just put this in, and if you call this from Python, uh, at least with some libraries, uh, this will be executed, <laughs> which I don't think it should be, right? I, I mean, I could put in here whatever I like, right? I can, uh, I, I can put in whatever code, and it will be executed. That seems very bad. Um, 
Uh, in fact, these kinds of issues have happened. Uh, there has been a huge vulnerability where basically, where, where absolutely every uh, user of Rails, Ruby on Rails, uh, had an exploit just because of YAML parsing in it. So like, no matter what you do as a Rails user, you just had this issue because Rails was using, is using YAML, because Ruby is using YAML as its configuration format. Uh, so that's already pretty bad. And there are lots of other possible security exploits as well with YAML. Um, uh, NoYAML.com also shows some great examples. For example, this one, uh, we write 4.30, right? And YAML is supposed to automatically know this is a string, right? So I don't have to put quotes in here. But uh, actually, I get this number when I put this in. Why? Because this colon means this is a time and not a string. And a time, of course, should be the seconds since the last midnight, right? And you can't really put quotes around it. You should put exclamation mark, exclamation mark, str. So if, in case you run into this bug, this is how you fix it. This is not great, right? Like I'm already wishing to go back to JSON where I can just put quotes around this. Uh, then of course, there's the very famous Norway issue. Uh, as you can maybe see, the syntax highlighting is slightly different for the NO than it is for the other values. So I'm just mapping country code to the name of the country, right? And you can expect like a huge configuration files with like 200 countries, which makes sense. Sometimes countries change. We don't want this hard coded in our code. So we just add like a little YAML file. Problem is this code will not work. Magnus, do you know why this code won't work? No. Amazing. Right. The answer is no, <laughs> because no is a Boolean. So this is a string. This is a string. This is a Boolean used as the key in this hash table. Yes, the word no written like this is a Boolean. So this is false. In fact, uh, this is like the like the YAML 1.1 spec has this description of what a Boolean looks like. You could say why, or why uppercase, or yes, or yes uppercase, or yes in caps lock, or n, or n, uh, and so on. All of these are valid ways to write booleans. So if any of these strings anywhere, they will not be interpreted as a string, they will be interpreted as a boolean. Also, by the way, I, I can just put this into this YAML file. Like this entire file that you're looking at is valid YAML, including this, which is a multi-line string by virtue of magic. Just it just works, right? Uh, <laughs> so that's bad. Um, then if you've ever used uh, AWS CloudFormation and their beautiful features and other AWS services as well, they give you uh, funny functions. So you can write exclamation mark or fn colon. And some of these work in some context, but not all. Uh, you can call a function. In this case, I'm using a substitution to substitute this with this. And then I have a reference in here that I put into the domain. So, right? So basically, I take the root domain name, which is a variable defined somewhere else. And of course, YAML doesn't have the concept of config variables, but AWS adds it anyways, and then I can add it here. So, just to be clear, in actuality, these things are strings and mappings and whatnot. And then AWS takes these strings and interprets them as kind of functions and evaluates them into a different kind of YAML concept. Because at the end, when you get a bigger and bigger configuration file, you will need stuff like this. You will need to be able to replace text. And you have this clunky way. And then like this is from the other like, standard documentation as like best practice, for example, to have this kind of sub where you have a bunch of replaces in there. Um, going, I'm replacing this variable and I'm doing this from this <clears throat> like namespace almost uh, and this variable uh, and so on. So you get to have a bunch of these in this kind of unreadable format with a lot of files. It gets really
we lost Till. We'll try to get him back uh, into the into the presentation again. Um, for those who saw Till's presentation and from Sweden would know that if you do. Oh, you're back, Till. Ah, can you hear ah. me? Yes, we lost you there for a while. Nice. Yeah. Uh, where, Welcome back. where was I cut off? Two. Yeah. Two minutes ago, one, one, two minutes ago. Okay. Um, where was I? Was I on there, this yeah, part? You, yes, exactly. You were on the Amazon. Perfect. Welcome Perfect. back, Phil. Uh, yes. So basically, all I have to say about this is that this is realistically what it looks like, except you don't just have one line of this. You have uh, thousands upon thousands of lines of this. And if you make a typo here, you don't get immediate feedback. You can try to install some uh, linting libraries that make it slightly more workable. But realistically, you will have to send it up to AWS and wait for a long period of time to check if it interpreted correctly. And some of these issues are hard to resolve because you would have to redeploy. So sometimes if you make a typo here, this typo will stay indefinitely. Very fun. Don't want to work with that anymore. So there are some other options than dealing with this than then just accepting the horrible fate of uh, YAML. Uh, one common option is TOML. Uh, it's the configuration format used by Rust by default. Um, and it works very similar to YAML. Um, it's also kind of flat, and but it's more structured. But it is uh, better because you can write down things explicitly. You're not that much, you're not white space focused and it doesn't have all these super weird bugs. So it's already an improvement. Um, uh, then some people decide to simply use a like real programming language as in if they're already working on a Python project, you can just use Python as your language for configuration because it's evaluated like as a scripting language and you can just set these parameters there and that works um problem is just like with yaml you are evaluating untrusted code in some cases that's just not what you want to do for security reasons uh it can get slow because you can't really know what um people will put into it if you put it like give it to other users and it's relatively hard to port like if you have one system like this you can't migrate to a different system you kind of locked in to how you're doing things uh, uh, yeah, forever, unless you want to do like a full rewrite. And uh, then there's also Q, which allows you to write basically like type annotations and validations for your existing configuration for like YAML or JSON or whatever. Uh, but of course, that adds an extra layer of work. But uh, could be could be good. I'll, I think all of these options are valid depending on your use case. But I want to show you a different option today, which is DAL. DAL is a uh, more function configuration language. And if you look at it, it already starts looking very similar to the JSON one, just different formatting, I guess. But we have a uh, key and value in our records are with braces. You have commas in between your values. Uh, you have quotes around your strings. So it doesn't magically assume what a string is. But I do have uh, comments, uh, which I think is already uh, like a huge improvement. Um, now, I previously made the point that there are typos in configuration files, and they can come to harm you, and nobody reads configuration files, right? And I've see, uh, shown this JSON, I've shown this YAML, and now I'm showing this DAL code. And unless you have seen this example before, because I stole it from the DAL website, you probably didn't notice that there's a typo here, right? This directory is my name here, my name here, and then it's a typo down here, which means this is actually a bug. And there has been a bug in the JSON, and has been a bug in the YAML. Uh, and the core of the issue here is that we are repeating the same string three times, and uh, of course, we now have to manually make sure that it's actually the same string every time. So we have to review it. And uh, with a large configuration file, these strings can be in different places and they can be used hundreds of times. And you always need to make sure they are the same. That is, of course, very annoying. So in DAL, instead, I can simply write let home uh, equals uh, slash home slash two. 
uh, in this thing. And then, boom, I can just use the variable. Uh, so at home equals home. For this thing, I uh, oh actually I do want the tracking slash here. Uh, I want home class plus, and then I can remove this part here, right? I can uh, plus plus just concatenates these strings, and in DAL I just have this available. Like I can uh, I can just write code like this that looks like code that is readable. Uh, I think even if you're not familiar with style, you kind of understand what's happening here, right? I have this let block where I define things before in, and then I define my actual value. It's up top before I do my configuration. I can define variables. And I, I think that's already like an improvement. Like I think at this point, we're already better than JSON, right? We have comments and we have these variables, which means we can reuse the same variable over and over again. Uh, and I think we can make it uh, even nicer because we can give this a, uh, what we can do is we can actually make a type. So we can do config, which is a type uh, equal to, uh, um, I can write a type definition. And I don't even have to think about this much because up top in line zero in my editor, it actually writes down the type that it had, has inferred from this part. So like even with, before I wrote any type definitions, my editor with DAL can already see what type my, my code has that I've written. And then I can just write, uh, there's a home, which is of type text. Um, then there is a, uh, a private key, uh, which is also of type text. And then there is a public key, also of type text. Now that I have this type annotation, I can simply put it here. And if I didn't make any typos, I can just say, this is of type config. Everything still checks. I didn't get any error. That means it has now type checked this and I've validated my configuration. Boom, done. That's like, I didn't need to install any separate tools. I didn't need to do anything. I just write my type, uh, which is a first class value to say, this is a text, this is a text, this is a text. I don't know whether it's text instead of string. It's uh, the same convention as in Haskell, but they just call it a text, right? That makes sense, right? This thing is just text. Um, yeah, and that works. Uh, now, to prove that it works, I can actually go and call this beautiful command line tool called dal2json, which uh, takes this file, which is uh, 06.dal in my beautiful naming scheme, and I can print out the generated JSON. And it's the same JSON as before. There are also tools for dal2 uh, YAML, dal2 whatever, right? Um, which means, great, we have basically the same JSON, we just made it a bit longer. We now have a variable and we have type checks. Um, let's look Let's look at this example though. So here I have the same stuff. I have my variable of uh, let home and I have this stuff where I now have two homes basically. Doesn't really make much sense, but let's say we have uh, let home two. is equal to home uh, slash Magnus, right? Magnus also is a user in this repo. Uh, so I want to be able to pass down a home to. This is relatively realistic, right? And we can generate this uh, JSON, of course. Uh, this is JSON number nine. This. And we get an error because I made a typo somewhere, did I? Uh, expression doesn't matter annotation. Yes, because this is, uh, yeah, I, I, I can. Ah, yeah, of course, I have to do home equals. Where's my equal sign? Yes, home to people. And I get this stuff. So I get error messages, by the way, that actually tell me what's going on. But let's not uh, talk about this. Uh, I have now JSON that has two 
uh, uh, that has two fields, right? I have Magnus and I have Tilda. They have both both part of this configuration. And this part is getting pretty long, right? So in fact, instead of making it longer, we can think about that we have the same issue as before, that we have repetitive stuff. In this case, we're not repeating a string, but we are repeating the structure because the home is always built in the same way. And then we are concatenating them, uh, these strings in the same way and so on, right? And this is, I think, a relatively realistic example that you have, uh, that somebody makes a configuration system where you can configure every single value, but then you, it turns out in production and practice, you have a lot of repeating structures because you're kind of doing the same stuff. And the answer is we can define a function. We don't have to think about how, too much how it works, but what we do now is I define a function called user. Uh, and this a function called user simply takes a text as a parameter, which is my username here, which is Till or Magnus. Uh, then I do the home, which is just home plus username and my trailing slash, select trailing slashes. And then I simply create the configuration, which is my record here, which takes a home. By the way, this is just a short syntax for doing home equals home, right? Don't have to write that down every time. Um, uh fundamentally the uh, with this stuff we get home equals home private key is set to home plus the private key string the public key is also this and then finally now that i have config and user as my defined things i can just do let uh, user till let user magnus done so my list is now very short and let me prove that it still works this is uh, 10 total. We still get uh, an array and we get uh, two, two JSONs. Um, so yeah, we have two JSONs and now we have a function that takes care of these parts. Now, there's only one step to make this even better. We can extract the type and the function that we have defined by the way, it goes from text to a configuration. So we have proper type annotations and everything into a separate file. Because if we do that, we just get this. I'm importing a thing called user uh, from my file importer DAL, which is just another DAL file that I'm calling. Um, and then I just do the call my user function and I can have my type annotations as this is a list of user configs. Boom, done. At this point, we started out being like, we have JSON, but we can add comments and variables that so gets a bit longer. But now we are actually significantly shorter than the generated uh, JSON code. So if I do run off dal, this is already still our, like all these lines. While here, I just have to write, uh, I just have to write this code, right? I import it and then I use it. That's all there's to it. Uh, the code becomes super simple. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I, I mean, I think just with this, we have variables, we have functions, we have types, we have imports. Our code becomes so much safer, right? Like this is already better. Uh, like if we think about this, we can refactor code, we can uh, do this nicely because there's one, one feature I also want to show you that it, I think is very nice. It's not necessary, but it's, uh, but it, it, it is very convenient to have, is I just refactored all this code and right I put it into a different type annotation to put it somewhere else so we can compare uh, 09.dal. Um, that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, we can go up here, we can have uh, 09.dal, which has all this long text, and we have 11.dal, which is all this short text, which I refactored. Now, refactoring is great and necessary to make improvements. And in programming languages, uh, we have tools to aid us with refactoring. So either you have the type system check that you're doing the same stuff still, but even better, you have unit tests, integration tests, and sometimes even end-to-end -end tests that tell you that after you did your change, the code behaves still roughly like it did before you did the changes, right? In theory, if you don't do any changes to your tests and you have like perfect test coverage, changing your code without changing your tests means if the tests still passed, you didn't change behavior of the application you're writing. And we don't have this concept for configuration files at all, usually, right? There's no way to go 
uh, what is the what is the behavior of my configuration file? And Dahl came up with a pretty clever idea to actually uh, enable us to do these kinds of things. Because when we're calling uh, Dahl, there is, I think it's called hash of, um, uh, I have a hash function, which I, if I do that on file09.dal, it prints me out some hash function. Uh, again, 09.dal is the one where we just manually write this down every time. Um, the interesting part is what if we do the hash of uh, 11.dal, which is the refactored one, the super short one, super nice one. We get the same hash. We don't get the same hash. I made a bug. I have a bug. We don't have the same hash. That's fun. Let's see if it's the same as 10. Yes, it's the same as 10. So did I make a difference? Magnus. That's fun. Uh... <laughs> um, basically, what this hash does is it doesn't hash the file itself. It hashes the output of the file. So basically, what we're doing is we are doing this hash to make sure uh, the contents are the same, and they are not the same, which means I made a uh, bug somewhere, which I think is fun. Uh, <laughs> um, so this allows us to um, reconfigure things Dil. and make these kinds of changes. Yes, Dil. the viewer saw it like a trailing slash. A trailing slash? Yes, yeah, somewhere. Oh, where is it? In in which file? In which it file? Should be nine then, as that's the diff. Right? Uh, yes. Oh, did, uh, home slash Magnus doesn't have the training slash. Ha 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 ha. Perfect. Thank you, viewer. <laughs> yes. Very was... good. Uh, still doesn't work. <laughs> uh, very good catch. But, or was it? But I think there's one more difference. This is home Magnus. And this is Magnus, spelled the same way, lowercase. Um, OK. Uh, still still wrong, but <laughs> you get the idea. You get the idea. You can actually make sure of these things, which is great. I, I think it's actually amazing to show that I cannot find the typo right now live, which means, yes, if I was working on this and I was tired and I was working on like 100 of these lines, I also wouldn't see the typo. So it's amazing to have these hash functions. I think it, it proves the point rather well that I'm failing at this. But you get the idea. If the content is the same, then the hash is the same. If the content is different, the hash is always different. But the structure and the shape, we can change. I can reorder things. I can extract things into variables, into functions. I can add type annotations. I can uh, use imports to put this into a different file. Everything uh, without breaking the hash, meaning I can safely refactor um, without having to worry about this. By yeah, the way, my have, file... We have, another, we have another review comment. If you compare home, it's like bin slash home and home. Oh, did I... Let home on that. Yeah, you have home only, and then you have bin slash home or slash bin. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Okay, that's, that's just um, my fault. That's just stupid. <laughs> now, now do we do it? That's great. That's, uh, it works. <laughs> Amazing. Same hash. To prove it, I will run uh, rather than this one again. Yes, same hash. Uh, thank you, thank you, commenters. Now they're all awake. Now they're all actually listening. <laughs> uh, that's good. Thank you very much. Uh, perfect. Yes, hash function worked. We have we have we have proven it. Uh, I cannot write a uh, configuration code. Uh, this was obvious all along. Uh, good stuff. Um, uh yes then um th this is already like such an improvement because in the end we can refactor because i can put stuff into variables i can put stuff into uh, functions and put stuff in uh, to imports and i don't have to be scared while doing this because i have type annotations that would crash if i do something weird and i have hashes that tell me i didn't change anything and even if i change something i know it still puts out the right type and the right things and so on, right? 
Um, and I think it's also worth noting that without any type of notation, it still worked, right? Like if you have something like JSON, you can basically write down a JSON file uh, and have it be very simple and interpret it as DAO, and it will still kind of work. Uh, you can just start with this and start adding comments. And so on. You don't need to type everything out. Uh, like the types aren't in your way. There are a few edge cases where you actually need to care about the types. Like if you have lists of things, well, different types, it gets gnarly. But um, generally, the types are just inferred. You don't have to care about it. It's done with magic. I think it's very good. Um, so I think actually we have seen enough features of DAL already. Like there are there are some more cool features and fun features. Uh, like you can do kind of list comprehensions, uh, like in the previous talk, a little bit even in DAL. Like you have list map and you have filter and so on. Not not super flexible, but you do have some of those which come in handy. And there are some other nice features. But I think we don't need more features, right? Like I, I like. Uh, Part that I complained about YAML was to having too many features, and I think DAL is still pretty minimal. You can read most configuration files with really with like the knowledge that you have now, right? You can look at it for like 20 minutes, and you understand the configuration, and you can read it. Um, but since I complained about YAML for having security issues, I think it's only fair that I look at the security question of DAL. Um, and they make it very nice because they have the safety guarantees page. This is the link as you can see on screen. You can also find the link if you just go to the Dalang.org uh, landing page. And this will be in the YouTube description, of course. Um, that you can't, uh, that they list out the safety guarantees that they make and the safety considerations that you should make when using Dal. Um, which obviously there is no perfectly secure tool. It always depends on what your threat model is, what what could happen, how you're actually using it. So I think it's very good that they um, go out there proactively and uh, list the potential issues, list how much, uh, what is safe, what they can guarantee. And they put a lot of care into this, which I think is nice. And of course, we are at a functional meetup. I think it's worth pointing out, DAL is very pure, right? Like we have functions, but they don't, uh, ever have any side effects, they are pure. And then what we can do is we can import other files and there's also an export feature actually to store dull stuff into a file, uh, but you can't do that in a function. So you can't do that within a loop. You can't just indefinitely uh, uh, do some weird hacks or something or send stuff to a server somewhere with details. Uh, it is very secure simply because you're just doing pure, pure functions. And I think it's the perfect application because in this configuration file, you never would want to modify anything, right? Like you are just reading out data and putting it in the right structures. Never do you want to uh, to run a syscall or mutate anything anywhere. So it's perfect because it's perfect for the domain. Uh, it makes sense. Even if you don't like pure functional programming, clearly this is a use case where it makes sense. Um, they also talk about injections, because what I didn't show you is you can not only use a file link, you can use a URL to import DAL code. And with normal code, that is an absolute no-go. Just going like run code from this URL, whatever, is insane, right? But with DAL, because it's so limited, you can actually have this kind of power and flexibility in a secure way. Because you can have hashes, you can say, use this from this URL. By the way, it should have this hash. So you can always use this import uh, safely. Then you can run uh, dal freeze as a command on a file, and it adds those hashes automatically. You don't even have to manually check hashes. It, it just does it for you. And then with normalization, you can import stuff. So I can do stuff like, I want to use this dal file from this website, and then I just normalize everything, and I have my dal file locally. Don't don't depend on that website anymore. I have everything locally and, and safe, uh, which is very cool, right? Like if you want to make a package or like a library in DAL, let's say gives a bunch of types and functions to model a domain or model a configuration uh, file, you can just upload those to a website somewhere. You don't need to do anything. It's just a DAL file hosted on a website somewhere and you can directly import it, but it's also safe at the same time, which I think is uh, insane because it's super convenient, super nice. Uh, of course we have strong type checking uh, which is, uh, oh, I mean, is this a functional program meetup? I think most people will already know the benefits of strong type checking. 
um, especially with inferred types so that you don't have to write down the types every time. And then there's an interesting part. It isn't Turing complete. So like, uh, I think this is an interesting point because uh, mm -hmm. like if you're like in university, you kind of learn that every programming language we use is always Turing complete. Turing complete just means we can kind of do everything a computer can do. Uh, and this one isn't. What uh, this specifically means is a Turing complete uh, system suffers from the halting problem. So whenever we have any kind of, say, a Python program, we cannot definitively say, will it halt or not? Oh, and I, let me correct that. Of course, for some Python programs, you can tell that right away. But there will always be some Python programs where you cannot tell, will this run forever, or will this stop immediately, or um, so on. It's undecidable. And it's like absolutely impossible to do. And what DAL is, DAL is what uh, they call a total programming language. And total means that it does, in fact, complete. So we can always type check in an expression in a finite amount of time. So I have my function that has its type annotations and so on. Within a finite amount of time, we can check, does this work? Which is good, because my editor shows the type annotations up top. Uh, if that would take forever, that would be pretty annoying. And this is not a given, by the way. Like, for example, in more broad languages like C++, for example, um, the type checking can take an indefinite amount of time. Uh, in practice, the compilers just after some time time out and say, no, I give up type checking this. This is too bad. Um, but it can happen that it runs forever. And then the more interesting thing is, once type checking is complete, it will always succeed in a finite amount of time. And that is the exact wording you get from the uh, DAL uh, manual, actually. I think this is a this is a super interesting point because not only does the function complete at some point, like if you call a function, it will at some point complete, it will give you exactly what you asked for. And I think that's interesting if you think about it because normal functions, like, like if I have my uh, public uh, static and main, right? Uh, or whatever non-functional programmers do, uh, this is claiming you will get an integer back at some point. The question is, will I get an integer back? And the answer is no, because there are like at least two different ways this can fail. Uh, one is this can actually like, this can th throw an exception, right? Uh, exception. In which case I will never get my integer back. So that was a lie. Or uh, it can just go uh, on in a, in a while forever and never return anything. So there are two valid ways in which this code might never give me my integer. So it's saying int main is simply a lie. And what Dahl says and what total programming means is it never lies. When if it says I will get you an integer, it will get you an integer. Or at least theoretically, right? Like it is modeled uh, after this. Of course, bugs can still happen, right? But within the language domain, within how it is modeled, there is no feature to break out of this. There is no please crash everything feature like throw exception that just makes it uh, stop work. So if I have my fun uh, type annotations, it's actually true. That is what total programming kind of means. That is incompatible with your completeness. Uh, that's good for a bunch of reasons. First of all, there's uh, fewer possible exploits because there's fewer things you can do. Um, like even in sandbox languages like JavaScript, every now and then you have uh, an exploit that reaches stuff outside of the sandbox because you're doing some uh, interesting magic. And there's just fewer things you can do. Like I cannot do a recursion, for example, in DAL because a recursion might not hold. So there's one less feature I can use to exploit. Uh, great thing is it just doesn't freeze forever. At some point, I will get my configuration file and can load it, which is good, right? Uh, it doesn't just crash. Like it either gets me a type error, or like an import error that I can't read the file, or it it works, which which is also great, right? Like I have a good error message, or it works. There's no weirdness. There shouldn't be, right? And it should. I mean, and then the idea is right. It should also come complete fast enough, right? Reasonably fast. Because if it's unreasonable, then 
there is the possibility of exploits like a DDoS attack, right? Like imagine some users sent you a server instead of JSON, they sent you DAL. Um, and it has all these functions. And if it were to take forever, then that would be a potential like DDoS attack, right? They can just send you a bunch of these DAL files and your server is overloaded after like five of them. And that would be very bad. Um, and this is still an issue set. <laughs> Um, so if I open the next file, I have just two things. I find a string, which is called A. I define a function, which I call D for no apparent reason, which takes a text and returns a text. This text is called T. And I'd simply concatenate T with itself, which is just fine, right? And I have D of X. And of course, if I, uh, uh, run dal to json on what's that 15 dot dal i simply get aa right this is completely fine now it's time for the chat to wake up again how do we make this very slow with just these parameters you don't need any loops you don't need uh, recursion you just just these things that you see uh, in front of us can we make this very very slow We're we're waiting for the chat. We're waiting for the chat. Yeah, Come on, chat, wake up. Yeah, I think we have some lag. That's why we're waiting for them to. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. Yeah. I mean, I'm pr pretty far away. Yes. Let let us see. Nothing else so far. No suggestions yet. No Otherwise, suggestions yet. No. People Magnus, are. Magnus, do you have an idea? You you can also think. If we are still reading a config file, it could be big. One suggestion. It could be big. It could be big. But if it's very big, then you already expect this, right? It's kind of boring. Yeah. Like, oh, I read this 10 gigabyte dial files and it was kind of slow. Mm. That works, mm. but it's not it's not it's not fun, right? Because that also happens with JSON. If you read a True. 10 gigabyte JSON, it's also slow. Yeah, I think it's more crushing if we are very, very slow, or we can't evaluate it all while we're being a very short file. Yeah, exactly. Come to come to a situation where you either do it infinite, like you. We can't do anything infinite, so mm -hmm. it is not during complete. We are guaranteed there are no infinite loops. Mm -hmm. There's no infinity. It's uh, that is thankfully impossible. It's like ruled out. There's no while true. There's no infinite recursion. There's no recursion. But we can still make it big, and only with the elements here. Um, the elements. There are no more. <laughs> there are no. <laughs> we don't have any more suggestions. Still, show us. Okay, perfect. I I, I show you. I show you. And, yes. and we we go the stepwise, right? Yes. Because I double. I, I I double the string, right? I go from a to aa. Very simple doubling function. What happens? If I go like this, I save this file and I run this file again. I have doubled my string again, right? So far, it's, it's a very short string, right? It's just four A's, right? What's, what's the worst that could happen? But uh, now something should feel kind of scary because we are doubling, right? And I add one more D, right? One more D. Not not a big deal, right? I have uh, I have three three doubling functions. I'm now at eight. Now first we had one a, then we had two a's, then we had four a's, then we have eight a's. We're doubling every time. This is exponential growth, right? That's the, we're already at exponential growth, and exponential growth is scary, right? Let me let me get more scary. Uh, now we have sixties uh, and nineties. Uh, let me add one more, and now I need to make these uh, parentheses work. And dum, 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 dum. Now they should be matching parentheses. How many A's do we get now? Uh, I already run it, but a chat, maybe somebody can scream it. I can actually just pipe this into uh, the beautiful word count program that, Unicode, uh, that Unix gave us. And we're running at 1,027. 
1027 is including the quotes and the new line. So without the quotes, it's 1024. So two to the power of 10 in our string. Uh, two to the power of 10 is already kind of bad. This is one kilobyte. We have Our string has the size of one kilobyte. Allocating one kilobyte is very fast. This program runs pretty fast. I mean, I can, uh, I can check how fast uh, this still runs, right? Time of this, 0 0.027 seconds. That's, that's fast, right? We don't have to worry about this. Now, what if I do this a few more times? Let me define a function that I would call k. k is of text to text. Uh, and it is equal to uh, 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 it is equal to taking a uh, t of type text, just like the other one. Um, but what I do in here, I simply take this part. So I do my doing d ten times of uh, t of course, right? So I'm just doing uh, this function. So if I just do this again, k of uh, x, this should be the same thing, right? We just get one kilobyte again. Uh, and if I run this, then yes, I still have one kilobyte, and it takes 0 0.2 seconds. Now, you can ask yourself, what if I add one more k? <laughs> and if you do this calculation, you might see where our problems start. So I will run this as well. The time is almost the same. It has barely increased because the counting uh, is fast and everything. But we just went from a kilobyte to a megabyte. Right? We're just adding one more K. We go from a kilobyte to a megabyte. If I add one more K, how much how much memory do I have to allocate? How big is my string? Right? Because at this point, you yeah. are allocating one string that is one gigabyte of size. It's just three Ks, right? And one gigabyte of size is bad. So I've tried this out before, of course, this presentation. And I will not run this code because this already makes my computer very slow. You have to understand this runs, allocates billions of strings, it creates billions of strings, merges them all together. And at the end, we get one string that is uh, a gigabyte long and then a lot of smaller strings also worth about a gigabyte or somewhat more. So we allocate like two gigabytes very quickly and that's already not nice. What if I happen to add one more K, right? Uh, because then I have to have one terabyte of memory. <laughs> so if I add one more K, my computer is basically dead. Uh, uh, so that's already enough. I don't have enough memory to run this even. And if I had enough memory, the time it would take to allocate all these strings would take on basically indefinitely. And this is with four Ks, right? Uh, if I add just five, six, seven Ks or something similar, uh, I can make it worse. And with every kind of code that I have like this, where it grows exponentially, and in fact, if I use this trick of continuously adding uh, new functions, like, right, I could do a function which is like uh, big, which calls k 10 times, and then a function called really big, which calls uh, big 10 times, and so on. I have faster than exponential growth, um, in com as in the amount of memory allocated in comparison to my file size. And I, like, this is a very short file, right? uh, and I can make it allocate many, many gigabytes of or terabytes or indefinite amount of memory, basically, with just this. Which means our total programming does not actually mean it will successfully compute uh, in the real world, right? It's just modeled to calculate, but you're still constrained by the amount of memory you have. Just as somebody just might pull the plug out of your computer and it will not succeed. Only within the models of the programming language it is guaranteed to succeed, not in the real world. Which makes it kind of sad. Uh, to be honest, I, I don't like this. Uh, you can make this as big as you want. You can make this as slow as you want. Again, I've tried the one that the, the next one, and it gets very slow. But you have to trust me on this one. I'm not going to do it during the presentation because then you probably can't hear me anymore. Um, and then, uh, yes, which means in practice. Um, we have to we have to still 
we can't just take untrusted code and run it indefinitely in a performance critical environment or where someone where might somebody might do a DDoS attack. Whenever we load DAL code, we need to set a some kind of timer. To be fair, that's uh, already a good idea, probably with other formats, right? Because other formats, if they get large, something might also take a long time and you don't want everybody to have the chance to just upload a huge file. But yeah, uh, those usually can contain the length of the file, which is easier. But a DAL, if you have untrusted code, you need a timeout. By the way, DAL libraries, so right now I'm just con uh, converting DAL to JSON. This works really well. But there are also a bunch of libraries for DAL for uh, plenty of programming languages where you can integrate it. And in those, usually you get a chance to set a timeout. So I, you can say, I want to load this DAL file within five seconds. And if you do that, then it works obviously much better uh, and you are much safer. You can also say limitations like, I don't actually want to be able to import other files, so no access to the disk, uh, these kinds of things, which make a lot of sense in, in certain contexts. Uh, so yeah, um, I, I think this is a little bit of a, uh, of a downer, but in conclusion, I think I really like DAL anyways. I think with these kinds of feature sets, obviously it's not for every context and every situation, but in certain contexts, it makes a lot of sense, right? Like, um, I, I know some programmers never get into the situation and they never have to struggle with these uh, super huge configuration masses. But uh, I'm pretty sure at least some subset of the audience right now has experienced huge configuration files. And they go like, well, yes, this is this is very good. I mean, I think it's like, I, I like it is, so obvious, like it kind of sells itself in the features. Now I have to say with a grain of salt, I haven't had the chance to use this in like a really big production environment yet. Like I've used very big YAML configurations, but I've never used like a very huge uh, DAO configuration. Uh, so maybe I'm missing something, but I think just with these very simple features, you don't even need most of them, just defining variables uh, and defining types when necessary uh it's already such a great thing by the way there is uh, a language server protocol uh, implementation available for dal as well so uh, several editors have great integration you might do things like go to definition on your variables and all that stuff there's auto formatting there is all these different kinds of tools for dal uh so yeah it, i think at the end of the day dal is great uh and i really want to recommend using dal uh if you want to learn more please go to dalang.org. Uh, most of the examples are, that I had in this presentation are just stolen from there. Um, actually from the landing page, to be honest, I really like those. Uh, there's a lot of documentation there. You can find links to libraries uh, for whatever languages. You can find uh, detailed documentation. There's the safety spec as well. And we'll put these links in the YouTube description, as Magnus likes to say. And uh, there's also the awesome DAL list on, on GitHub, which is very nice. It just shows you a bunch of other projects and tools uh, that you can use on DAL. And I really recommend uh, checking it out. I also want to say that while you can use these fancy libraries that have everything integrated, I would actually recommend if you have a big configuration, but just do it step by step, because you can use dial to JSON or dial to YAML or whatever to just comp uh, convert one file, and then you can basically, if you can convert one file, you can already start like doing a partial migration, adding like a little bit, like all new stuff is added in dial, then you can slowly add type annotations, slowly add functions, and you can take this huge configuration blob and turn it into um, uh, turn it into something more manageable. If you're creating a new project and you just have this tiny bit of configuration, uh, DAL might seem a little bit like overkill. No, I think your configuration will grow because it always does. So maybe it's worth checking out. But if it is tiny, I would say maybe please don't, just don't use YAML. Maybe just use JSON because then you can just create JSON from DAL and it's 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 very safe and clean. Yes. But if you have more questions about this, you can also uh, send me an email to till at specificadvice.com. You can also go to specificadvice.com, which is my like company website in case you want to hire me for any freelancing work or anything like this. Say you need somebody who to work on your configuration files. Uh, you can uh, contact me there, or you can obviously ask questions now um, because if you're now listening live.
Uh, so, Magnus, are there any questions yet? Thank you very much. As always, daring to live code. Also, I think you proved yes. the point with why, why you want the hash <laughs> in yes. the presentation uh, as such immediately. It showed. And yes, I've been, I, I never thought I about... I should have planned this. <laughs> yeah, I never thought about... I mean, the configuration language should be obvious because yeah. if you've worked for a while with software development, you will have seen configuration files and you will have made fault in them and you would spend at least a couple of hours debugging stuff until you realize you, you're missing a, uh, some trail slash or some hyphen, something yep. somewhere which is not shown anywhere and you're just going to be extremely annoyed. <laughs> yep, in absolutely. the end, you're not going to touch them. It, in the end, it's like someone else will touch these. Don't touch the configuration files. We did it once. It yes. was a huge mistake. <laughs> We're never yes, going to do exactly. it again. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. Let us see, there is a question. Is there a benefit of testing your refactory by comparing hashes than saying diffing, diffing the JSON outputs? I mean, what would be the difference? Um, I think order of parameters can still be different in the generated JSON while not being different in the hash, right? Because a JSON in the records are not supposed to be order dependent. In theory, the order should always be the same. So I think if you like, have different null versions of refactor, the order of parameters might be different. Um, but yes, if you generate the same JSON, the same order, and do the same formatting of the JSON, then it should be the same hash. Mm. Uh, maybe that's actually how it's implemented. I don't know. I haven't checked. Right? But yes, you could, of course, do this. You can, of course, do this with your JSON as well if you, if you know what you do. Yeah. Correct. Cool. Um, yeah. A really, really nice example. Um, people that know Swedish will know that the month October is the only month that differs between English and Swedish in when, when done in abbreviation, which means system runs for nine months, works, 10 months doesn't work. No one knows why. <laughs> and that figure figures, well, oct, oct, wait, Ooh, now I found it. Yes, exactly like a little bit like you showed with the till and just switching INL. It's very easy. You don't see it. You're in a hurry. Boom, yes, you put exactly. it out somewhere in some environment, doesn't work, you don't understand why. Scratch yes. your hair. You re revert your own git commit because you think it's the code. <laughs> well, it's not the code. Ah, no, it's <laughs> yes. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I love that example on the landing page, which is, by the way, great because uh, I copy pasted the code and in the original example, the name is Bill. Mm. So since I, my name is Till, I just need to change <laughs> one letter. <laughs> yes, very nice, very nice, Till. And as you mentioned, we'll put every, all the links below the presentation and everything on the meetup page. Everyone can find the language itself. Yeah. Thank you very much, Till. I'm checking the the chat right now there's no more questions so thank you very much Amazing. for a very nice presentation where you prove the point more or less <laughs> <laughs> thank you as well yes. for having me yeah. nice. have a nice day and to everyone else thank you for watching Funk Prog Sweden and thanks for bearing with us so have a nice evening day or wherever you are night bye for now and see you in September <laughs>